welcome. <laughs> Weather has been a little challenging today for, uh, for us, but it's okay. It's good to have you. First thing I want to tell you is that this, this uh, lecture is being live streamed. So if you're sitting in this room, there is the probability that you will be on a camera at some point. And anybody that doesn't want to be on a camera, there's a room next door that you can watch it live stream. Um, so if everybody's okay, we're going to get started. So I'm Todd Mansfield. I'm one of the owners of Core Life. And uh, um, and I uh, appreciate being uh, my background in physical therapy. Spent a long time in that world. And a couple years ago, changed from that world to uh, health and nutrition and thinking about health in a different way. And Dr. Benner is a uh, good friend of mine, and he's been sort of on this journey on health with me. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about pain. And uh, you're on. Okay. Thanks, Todd. <clears throat> Thank you, Cor. Thanks for having us this opportunity for us all to get together and have this event and talk. Sounds okay. All right, so my guess is that many of you in this room have chronic pain or have a loved one with chronic pain. The stats suggest that the numbers are really, really overwhelming. So that's why I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to everyone tonight about different directions we can go in chronic pain, um, what we're doing now, and, and how we can maybe do it a little differently. Uh, my background is, if those of you who don't know, uh, I've been in the community practicing about 12 years. I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training, and I did a spine surgery fellowship and did a lot of spine surgery. Uh, in my training, we also did uh, pain treatment as well. And so I had the unique opportunity to see orthopedic patients and spine patients and then pain patients. And so people who did really well, people who did just sort of okay, and I also saw a lot of people who just weren't doing that great and who needed more. And so I think we had good success with the traditional approaches. And you know, Todd and I worked very closely at that point. And we were having good success, but we wondered, what are we missing? Why do we have people who we've got perfectly normal MRI, perfectly normal x-ray, and things aren't good, and they've got a ton of pain? Why is that? What are we missing? Or why do we have the patient who had a really good operation, and the x-rays look good, everything looks perfect, why are they having pain? And it led us down this road of exploration to what, what's going on, is there something deeper? And, and it brought us to functional medicine. And functional medicine is this concept that turns modern healthcare on its head a little bit. Typically in Western medicine, we look at symptoms. What are the symptoms? And we treat the symptoms, and we assign you to a group based on your symptoms. You've got high blood pressure, you're in this group. Functional medicine says, what if it's different? What if all these symptoms are all part of an underlying problem? And if we can attack the problem, if we can treat the problem, if we can correct the problem, what does that mean? Can we get people better? And so I think this is a, w this is a world where pain really works well if we integrate it. And so that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. So my approach to this, just to cut to the chase, is I think really a multidisciplinary, integrative approach to treating chronic pain is the only thing that's going to make sense. We've got to pay attention not to symptoms of pain, but we've got to pay attention to what are the underlying problems that may be involved here. And so one of the things that I think is very important is lifestyle. And so lifestyle medicine is very, very important. And tonight, one of the pillars we're going to talk about is uh, nutrition. I really like this quote. Half of learning is learning, and the other half of learning is unlearning. And so that's exactly what I had to do when I went down this pathway. We said, I got to redefine how I understand things a little bit if I'm going to make sense to the people that were failing with traditional medicine. And so I'm going to give you the same challenge tonight. For the next hour or so that we're together, I want you to forget what you know a little bit. Not every, but I, wanna for, I want you to forget maybe your label. I want you to forget that, hey, I'm a, I'm a ruptured disc or I'm a fibromyalgia patient or you know, I, I'm a multiple sclerosis patient. All those things are probably true. But there may be more to it. There may be this underlying issue that we can address and try to do something with. So here's the harder question I pose to everybody tonight, those here and those live stream, is are you willing to get better? Are you willing to do the hard thing that it's going to take? Now, maybe it's, 
Maybe you're doing all the right things. That's great. But maybe you aren't. Maybe you're going to have to change your lifestyle. Maybe you're going to have to change your medication. Maybe you're going to have to change the way you approach your treatment. Maybe you're going to have to come off your pain medicines. Maybe you're going to have to go on a pain medicine. So just I want you to keep an open mind. If you're why, your why to get better, if that's big enough, then I think we've got something that we can work with. So here's our objectives tonight. And I feel free to make this a conversation. We're a small group. I, I know we've got people joining us online. But let's make this a conversation. If questions, issues come up, let's just kind of talk through them. I want you to know more about chronic pain and treatment options. I want you to determine if there's other options that can help you. And then know how you can start to take control of your pain. And then finally, this is not healthcare right now. This is me talking. So if you've got specific questions about what you should specifically do with your specific health problem, you have to talk to your doctor about that. And granted, I'd be happy to see you and talk to you about it as a, as a doctor as well. So where we're going tonight, number one, I'm just telling you where we're going so we don't get lost here. Chronic pain is a problem. I'm going to about that. We've tried to treat pain the same way for really thousands of years. We need to look at the big picture. I'm going to tell you the gut is a very critical piece of this and nutrition really matters and I think if we start addressing those things we're going to start making some differences. Okay, so chronic pain is a huge problem. If we look at the things we think of in healthcare as being huge, like cancer, we think cancer is a huge problem. It affects 11.9 million Americans. We think diabetes, heart disease, look at these numbers. Chronic pain, huge, huge number. So out of those in chronic pain, with a single diagnosis, the biggest one, low back pain, headache, neck pain, facial pain, which is horribly debilitating. And then this other group here, the, bi the biggest group is a combined group. So that may be you have a hurt knee, you've got pain in your hand, you've got fibromyalgia, you've got MS, you've got cancer pain. That's what this group is. So the numbers are big as well, and, and we've got about 500 million uh, that we're spending, I'm sorry, 500 billion that we're spending yearly on pain. And so for all these people, half of the people don't have control. They feel they have no control over their life and their pain. Um, three quarters feel depressed. Two thirds have problems with quality of life, don't feel that life's too good. 70% can't concentrate, and 86% can't sleep well. Pretty devastating numbers. So why are we doing such a poor job? Is it just that we don't understand pain? Is it that we've never thought to treat it before? I mean, with, a, with 100 million Americans, it's a big number, so we're not doing something right. So if we look back at the history of pain treatment, we just recycle the same ideas again and again and again. So we've got texts that go back from ancient Egypt you know, 1500 BC, the Sumerians and the Assyrians were using opium, you know, a poppy plant, and it's been used for a long time. So, in the 1800s, we figure out how to pull morphine out of opium, and that was helpful. 1898, Bayer comes out with heroin, and heroin was a wonder drug at the time, at least that's what it was touted. Ten times more powerful than morphine, and not addictive. And so it came out, and everyone loved heroin. It worked well. A year later, they're making a ton of it a year, one ton. And a year after that, in the United States, so this is 1900, we have 200,000 people severely addicted to heroin. Congress passes a law, heroin's no longer legal, and bears out of the heroin trade by 1913. So you'd think we probably learned our lesson. But let's do the same thing all over again. 1995, OxyContin's approved. 1996, OxyContin comes out. And it gets advertised as a wonder drug. And there's no, there's no ceiling. You can take as much OxyContin as you want without concerns. And unfortunately, at the same time, nursing organizations come out and say pain is the fifth vital sign. No one deserves to be in pain, which we all agree. We don't want anybody in pain. But what did we do? We threw as much OxyContin at people as we could. And it worked for a couple of weeks. But then the problems come. And so what we, what we learned through this whole thing is that opioids aren't great for us. They are very, very good for a short period of time. They're excellent for surgical pain. They work really well. They work great for end-of-life cancer pain. But for chronic, ongoing conditions, they're not great. Now, listen, some of you may be on chronic opioids and say, no, you're wrong. I'm doing well. 
perfect. And I would, I would say there are people who are doing very well on opioids. There's downsides, and we're not talking about the downsides. There's immunological downsides. It does impact the immune system. There's hormonal downsides. Testosterone starts to fall. There's GI downsides. MRI studies have shown that the brain changes within a month and your dopamine centers, that little center that you push on to feel good, to get rewarded, that changes after being on opioids just for a month. And so there's some real long-term things. Now what we're now starting to hear is the inflammatory cascade is being turned up in some cases in the brain for people who are on chronic opioids. And so boy, if I'm in chronic pain, I don't want inflammation. And so we get in this situation where maybe we're chasing our tail a little bit with this medicine. Not, again, I'm not telling you there's no, there's no role for it. I'm telling you just be careful with it, and we need to understand pros and cons whenever we're doing anything medically. Cannabis, 1800s, cannabis was great for headaches. People loved it. 1874, it was the, the height of cannabis. It was mainstream, gets outlawed by Congress, and here we are again going back to cannabis. And we just keep recycling these themes. And you know what? There's probably going to be a role for cannabis in select people. I think it's probably going to work. Torpedo fish, electrical energy. That's how we used to treat people in, in Greece thousands of years ago. It worked. So what did we do? We used TENS units. They work. There's a place for that. And spinal cord stimulation, a place for that. It's all based on this idea that electricity can make a benefit too. In the 1900s, steroids were very helpful and people were on steroids for their rheumatoid pain, whatever they wanted to call it then. But steroids had a downside, and anyone who knows anyone who's got rheumatoid arthritis or chronic breathing difficulties knows that chronic exposure to, to steroids thins the skin, it hardens the immune system, it, it changes the person in many ways. And so non-steroidals came out in 1960 saying, hey, we're non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and they worked really well. And so they were the mainstay of treatment for a long time, and I'm certain that many of you, almost everyone in this room has had NSAIDs at some point you know, Advil, Aleve, ibuprofen, and they work really well. But what happens in 2015, the FDA comes out and says, hey, by the way, your, your risk of heart attack and stroke is real if you're taking these things. And so people with cardiac conditions really are warned, be very careful, because this stuff can really hurt you. So what am I saying? Am I saying drugs are bad? No. I'm saying there's a place. But I'm saying drugs don't, don't take care of all of it. If it did, no one would be here, no one would care about chronic pain, it'd be taken care of. The fact is, medications play a role, but they're not the whole treatment. So let's talk about pain, okay? Let's shift, talk about pain a little bit. What is it? Well, it's an electrical signal that travels through the extremity. So you put your hand on the hot stove, hurts, you got a thermoreceptor in your hand, you've got electrical signal that comes up your nerve, goes to your spinal cord, makes its way to the brain, tells you something's going on down there. So a lot of us say, I wish we didn't have pain. There are some people that wish they did have pain. You know, people who have leprosy, hor horrible problems, they don't feel pain, and that's one of the major, not the only issue going on with them, but it's just to show pain is a good thing when it makes sense. Chronic pain, that's a different story, and that's what we're about today. So chronic pain is pain that either lasts three to six months. I usually define it though as more pain that stopped making sense. It's no longer telling you some useful information. But what happens is as chronic pain goes on and on and on, it starts changing things and it starts changing the pain system and it makes you increasingly sensitive. And then you start having trouble with these sorts of things, sleeping, walking, driving, sitting, intimacy, employment, housework, dinner with friends, watching TV. So you get dysfunctional, what happens? You become isolated. And so what we go from pain being a simple signal, an electrical signal, to becoming really an emotional experience. And there's times a lot of fear associated with that emotional experience. So we know kinds of pain, right? Everyone slam their finger in the door, they know that kind of pain. We got this neuropathic pain. This is very challenging for many people. Burning, tingling, shooting, the electrical sensation. Central pain is a little different. This slide just reminds, it's humbling, this slide, because it shows us how little we know. I mean, when I was even in practice, not just in med school, but in my early practice, 
these kinds of things, we had no idea what they were. We had no idea what caused them. And patients usually would leave the office. My doctor thinks I'm crazy. There's nothing wrong with me. It's in my head. So we know a couple things. Now we know fibromyalgia. It's not just I heard everywhere. It's actually some fMRI studies or functional MRI studies are showing the brain works a little differently in these people. We see this chronic brain inflammation. And some studies are suggesting the machine, the motor in the, each cell that makes energy doesn't work right. And so it makes dirty fuel. So it doesn't make enough energy. And the energy it makes, it kicks off a lot of toxins or oxidants. And so we're starting to go down that road with fibromyalgia and seeing some people actually get better. Irritable bowel syndrome, recently read a study that showed people with irritable bowel, some people don't have a specific chemical in their gut. So normally the gut is supposed to make a natural kind of opioid. So as your guts are churning to move things along, there's a natural opioid that's released so it doesn't hurt so much. One of the studies showed people with irritable bowel, some of them don't produce that opioid. There's an inborn metabolism error. And so we're saying, okay, so now we're starting to see why these people hurt. They don't, they don't have the same machinery as, as everybody else. And tension, headache, and some other types of low back pain, same. But that, the idea here is this is just a very humbling, humbling thing for us to think about is we don't know what we think we know. And we get a little dangerous when we get too confident. So causes of pain, physical pain, Injury, degenerative problems, kind of very similar. Inflammation, autoimmune, cancer, maybe similar in many ways. We're starting to learn some of this may be similar. Toxins, we live in a very toxic world. It's probably more toxic than it's been before. And infections. So what do they do? Well, these things all contribute toward making physical pain. And so we know with people with chronic pain, they start having dysfunction. They can't do as much. They become isolated. It starts to be a suffering component. We get sleep problems. There's a sadness, this emotional component along with it, and then hormone changes. And so if we're not treating all these things, it's no wonder that we're doing a poor job with chronic pain. This thing, this thing we're trying to hit at, and it's a moving target, just when we think we get, you know, we've treated the dysfunction, we, we fixed your back with physical therapy, because now you, know, you kick down a muscle that has been quiet for a long time. Now the dysfunction might be normal. But now we've never fixed your thyroid. That drops off when you have chronic pain. And so this target is moving. And problem is some of these people just can't get better because we're not addressing it all. So quick review. Chronic pain, it's difficult. It's difficult for the patient. And truthfully, it's difficult for the healthcare community. Statistics suggest that the diagnosis is hard even for the best clinicians. Even for people who see it every day are going to get it wrong in chronic pain patients because there's so much going on that we don't know about. Our traditional approaches just don't seem to get, just don't seem to be adequate. So I, again, I said this, as I look at a patient and it, we give the diagnosis of herniated disc, we sometimes narrow in on herniated discs because we're getting more and more reductionistic. We're getting more and more specialized. No one's looking at the big picture. The doctor's not looking at the big picture, and the patients aren't looking at the big picture either. None of us are. So we're giving our health care over to a health care system when we need to take a control over a huge portion of it. But I do think there's hope. I think we can, we can do it better. So this is, kind, this is how I see uh, chronic pain management at this point. So let me kind of walk you through how my mind's working with this. So in the middle is, is the patient. And the, uh, obviously, the patient's in the middle, but every patient comes with different things, comes with different life exposures, different life experiences, different needs, different ages, and different genetic backgrounds. Because as we're starting to learn, there are genetic differences in people that make them either more or less sensitive to pain, and some of those things can be corrected with, with different nutritional supplements. Medications. I've kind of railed on medicines a little bit for the, the first part, but there's a real role for medicines, and I'd be, I'd be untruthful if I didn't say I use medications in people. Now, do I use a lot? No, but I do think there's a huge role, and it's not just opioids. There's anti-seizure medicines. There's anti-inflammatories. All these things can play a role. Physical therapy. I think it's huge for many of our musculoskeletal conditions. I would add to physical therapy that we're also talking about a good physical therapist, not any physical therapy. So people may say, well, I have already done physical therapy, didn't work. Well, maybe you didn't do the right therapy. 
I mean, if you just sat and had massage and stimulation put on you, maybe we didn't address all the spine things that have gone wrong over the years. Maybe we didn't assess the posture. Reversible or reversible. Sometimes you need to get your knee replaced. Sometimes you need to have your ruptured disc taken out. Not always, but sometimes you do, and so there's a real role for that. Well, we also have this reversible side, and that this is I'm going to talk about things like neuromodulation or spinal cord stimulation or high frequency stimulation or DRG stimulation. These are th ways that we're sending electricity into nerve structures in a helpful way where we're reducing pain. And right now, we're seeing an explosion of new technology here that's very helpful, and we're being able to treat people we've never been able to treat before. Specifically, we're having great success with things like complex regional pain syndrome, which have been really not treated well. Things like post thoracotomy pain, things like post-mastectomy pain, things like pelvic pain and groin pain. We're starting to be able to do things before we really didn't have good options before. Right in the middle between surgical and the stimulation phase, we do things like radio frequency ablation. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a, a needle that goes on a nerve structure, and we send a radio frequency energy, a, a, a pulse energy through there, and it stuns the nerve, makes it so it doesn't work well. And so in people, you can get six to nine months of pain relief sometimes with many of these issues. So this is what we traditionally do. And I'd say very often, this stuff worked. But if it's not on this firm, solid foundation, it will not work. And so what's the firm foundation? Well, there's a metabolic and a lifestyle component. And so I just want to talk briefly about what that is. So metabolic says, we're going to look at your hormones that they matter, whether those be your adrenals, your thyroid, your it's all come into play. We're going to look at energy production. Remember we talked about that mitochondria with fibromyalgia? Are you making the right amount of energy or do you not have the building blocks of energy? What are you doing with the, with the detoxification? What are you doing with the garbage that your cell makes? That garbage is supposed to be cleaned up. Do you have the right amount of antioxidants to clean up that garbage? On the lifestyle side, we're looking at nutrition, we're looking at exercise, we're looking at stress management, and we're looking at sleep. All those are vital. Those four things are my pillars of lifestyle. This, I can't do for you. The healthcare community can't do for you. This is something you have got to do. And those of you who feel powerless, there's your power. Right there is something you can do right away. Now, to go back a minute, the order sometimes matters. Like, we've got all these things, and yes, we need a firm foundation, but sometimes the order of these things in matters. I'll take for an example, there's a guy I saw just last week in the clinic, who I treated years ago, who had ruptured a disc, um, at work, didn't do well, was unhealthy, tried surgery, still didn't do too well. We'd previously tried therapy and chiropractic care and medications, and none of that stuff worked. We did a spinal cord stimulator on him, and boom, leg pain was cut in half within a couple of days, and he was happy, it, but the pain started getting worse and worse and worse again. And so I challenged him on this stuff, and that was probably a year ago. He's since worked out at the pool. He started just doing aqua aerobics, moved into doing swimming. Now the guy does laps every day. He's down 60 pounds, eating well, now feels better than he's ever felt. Now listen, he'll never go back to work because he did heavy manual labor. But he's out, he's out uh, volunteering his time, he's taking care of people in his church and community, and feels better than ever. So what I'm telling you is order matters. And so in this guy, we needed to do this but he didn't have the energy to do it until we cut his pain in half a little bit, even though we'd done all these things. So if you say, well, I've done some of those, well, maybe you didn't do them quite in the right order. So don't give up hope. There's, there's options. So what are we looking at? And gut is what I'm really going to concentrate on right now. Okay, we got the hormones and, the, and all these other things that we already talked about. But gut is really where lifestyle and metabolic kind of collide. Now, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, he was around a couple years ago before Core came out and said food should be our medicine and medicine should be our food. And I think he was on to something, and we, we forgot about that. And so now we're going to recycle that good idea. We saw how opioids recycled and cannabis recycled and electricity. Now let's recycle.
this because this is an easy one and I think this is a really good idea. So it turns out that the fuel you put in your body actually matters. I mean, you think about that's not surprising. Of course it matters what we put in. But I think we've forgotten that. And we forgot that in America for a long time. And some of the stuff we're putting into our mouth, it's not food. Some of this stuff is just pure chemicals and we're eating it all day long and, and neglecting food and wondering why the, why the car doesn't run when we're putting the wrong kind of gas in it. The American diet has fallen so short of what it used to be. And particularly over the last few decades, it seems like things have gotten worse and worse and worse. And maybe, maybe that's got something to do why we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. I mean, even back when I was, my undergrad, I went to Cornell, undergrad in nutrition. And Cornell, I'd say, had one of the top nutrition programs, maybe, maybe in the world. You know, certainly in the country, but maybe in the world. And guess what? Everything we learned was wrong. It was all wrong. It's been proved wrong. All we cared about were carbohydrates and proteins and fats and how many calories did you have. A calorie is a calorie is a calorie. It was so wrong. What we forgot is that the food you put in your body impacts the hormone systems. There's impacts on your glucose system. There's impacts on, on some of your, the remainder of your hormone systems, even sometimes on your sex hormone systems. We forgot about antioxidants. We forgot about these phytonutrients or these chemicals that are in uh, vegetables and fruits, these things are really important. And so not to get you, that's interesting, not to get you lost in this sideways uh, picture, but I, I want you to understand that these phytonutrients, the colors that are in your food, these things get into our bloodstream. And if you don't believe me, think about the last time you ate asparagus. Do you ever go to the bathroom after you ate asparagus? There's an odor, right? It doesn't take long. And what, what that should show to you is this thing I put in my mouth got in my bloodstream. That's aspergusic acid. It's this little phytonutrient in asparagus. And it got into the bloodstream, and you can tell. It got through the cells. Well, the same thing happens with much of the things we eat. The good things, the antioxidants, the omega-3 fatty acids, the phytochemicals, those go in. But the bad things go in too, and they bind to our cells and actually speak to our cells. So I'll give you an example. Who knows what that is? Anybody know? Kohlrabi, good. Did someone say cruciferous? Oh, very good. It's cruci they're cruciferous vegetables. So kohlrabi, cabbage and cauliflower, broccoli and Brussels sprouts and kale and uh, some mustard greens. Anyone know? what sets these apart from the rest of the vegetables. There's, an, there's a special phytonutrient in there, sulforaphane. So sulforaphane is a neat one. I mean, it's, like, it's almost like we were made to eat this stuff. Sulforaphane, when it go <laughs> when sulforaphane goes in, it gets into our cells, and it binds to our DNA, and it turns our DNA on to do certain things, and it turns on this detoxification engine. And all of a sudden, the sulforaphane tells our cells to detoxify for the next 72 to 96 hours. That sounds like a good thing. So to me, I'm having one of these in every meal. So I think that's a great example of the, these things actually speak to our cells. So what we're going to talk about from here forward, nutrition, how it affects pain, and a lot of how it does is through inflammation. So inflammation, what is it? I mean, we're going to bear with me for a couple of definitions here so we can make sense of it. Inflammation is the normal response of our immune system to infection or trauma. Right? It makes things hot. It makes things swollen. It makes things red. You cut your hand. You know what that looks like. You know what that feels like. You get an infection. You know what that looks like. It knows what it feels like. A healthy immune system is supposed to do a couple things. It's supposed to be defensive. It's supposed to wipe out the bad guys, wipe out the dead tissue, wipe out the cancer cells. It's supposed to be restorative. It's supposed to repair damage. And finally, it's supposed to be tolerant. And this is a key one. So what's tolerance mean in the immune system? Anyone have any idea? Tolerance means it knows the difference between us and not us. So we don't want our immune system to attack us. So what happens in an autoimmune condition? It starts to attack us. 
So it's a misfiring of this immune system, and it may be due to chronic inflammation. Inflammation, 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 inflammation. Next thing you know, your immune system is on, it's on, it's on, and it loses control. So what happens when inflammation goes unchecked? Bunch of things. Sometimes through autoimmunity, allergies, obesity, diabetes, these are all chronic inflammatory processes. The more we learn about inflammation, the more we see this is in the middle of everything. So could the increase in pain have a dietary role? My suggestion is yes. From what I've seen, from what I've read, I think our diet has a lot to do with pain and inflammation. So processed foods, excess carbohydrates, trans fatty acids, don't get lost in this, too much of the bad fats, not enough of the good fats, not enough vitamin D, insufficient phytochemicals. Let's talk about vitamin D for just a minute. We live north of Virginia. North of Virginia, you can't make enough vitamin D without supplementing it. You just can't. In the winter, the angle of incidence of the sun is not enough. Vitamin D plays a very important role in the immune system. Some studies have shown the number of cancers that can be avoided with the proper amounts of vitamin D. It's just not something we look for. When I look, I'm surprised when someone has a normal level. They're almost always terrible. So vitamin D is something to keep in mind. All right, so inflammation, how does it, what does it do? Why is it so bad for chronic pain? Listen, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Let's look at a knee for just a minute. So you get a swollen knee, a hot swollen knee. Here's this nerve coming out that's saying inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. It goes, makes its way into the spinal cord. It makes its way to the brain, and we realize we've got inflammation. The problem is when inflammation goes for a long period of time, all of a sudden we start changing the pathways. We change the brain, we change the spinal cord, and we make it tuned to really sense pain. We actually change the DNA in some of these structures. We don't change the DNA, but we change the way the DNA is expressed in a lot of these structures. And now we're very, very efficient at sensing pain. Okay, so you say, great. So what if I have a knee ache for a long time? I may, everything may start to hurt. Yeah, but what if the knee's not causing the inflammation? What if there's something else causing chronic inflammation in the body and it's priming the rest of the pain system to go berserk? So where's most of the immune system live? Lives in the gut. 70 system lives in the gut. So let's just talk about the gut. And it, Todd, I'm going to steal your analogy, if you don't mind. So the gut, let's think of the gut as a garden hose. It goes from the front end to the back end. And it's not just a garden hose, but it's a soaker hose. So you put stuff in the hose, and it's only in the hose until it goes out through the little holes in the soaker hose to get into the body. So what you eat really doesn't go in you until it gets absorbed. Okay, so that's how we're gonna think about the gut. Let's, let's not confuse it. That's what the gut is. It's a big, long hose that stuff can come, can get into. I'm sorry, can get into the body. There's an important part about the gut. The gut's not just you. There's lots of other stuff that lives in the gut that takes up residence in the gut. Now, I was in medical school. We weren't talking about this stuff because no one knew about it. Probably only in the last six to maybe eight to 10 years have we gotten really to understand this. We, this is not just Matt Bennett. This is Matt Bennett with about two to three pounds of bacteria sitting in his guts. Maybe it looks like more, but it's two to three pounds. And so 100 trillion organisms, we've got lots of things in here, and they outnumber us. The number of cells inside, the, inside this cage, more bacteria than there are me, and way more genetic information in it of the bacteria than me. You say, okay, great. Well, here's an interesting thing. The bacteria, we feed them. And how do we feed them? Well, we feed them with roughage stuff we can't eat. They eat the fiber. They eat the non-digestible starches. They eat that. And then they do stuff for us. And some do good stuff and some do bad stuff. We'll make it very basic. So you look at two different people. You examine this, the stool for bacteria content in two different people. You look at a heavy person and a thin person. Completely different bacteria. You can characterize it as completely different. What's really neat is if you take the fecal matter 
from the skinny person and put it into the heavy person, the heavy person becomes skinny. So the bacteria are doing something. They're, 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 they're teaching our body how to work. Some of the bad bacteria, well, not bacteria, but candida, you know, one of the yeast, that releases this little substance that goes to our brain and whispers in our ear, eat sugar, eat sugar. You can't get away from it. It literally tells the brain, go on a hunt for sugar. Why? Because that's what candida eats. So you want to starve. I think you want to starve the bad guys and you want to feed the good guys. So we're going to get to in a minute. So here we are, the gut. Let's get to this for just a minute because I talked to you about the immune system. I need to just make this point. Here's your soaker hose. This is the inside of the soaker hose. This is the, out, this is the outside. This is the human body. Wow. That is really neat. This is where the immune system lives, just inside the, just inside the gut. So out here are the bacteria and the food. This, these little thing that looks like brushes, hair brushes, that's the intestinal border. That's where you absorb everything. And you can look how tight these cells are packed together. This is normal. Under here is where the immune system lives. Normally, I mean, we're made in this amazing way. These cells normally, they don't eat what we eat. If they did, you can imagine, they'd gorge and the rest of our body wouldn't get food. So it's kind of neat that we were created that this thing eats something that's produced by the bacteria. So you've got good bacteria. They eat the roughage that you can't digest. That, that bacteria creates this thing called N-butyrate and that feeds the cell. And so then the cell is healthy and happy. You're feeding the right stuff, that roughage, that vegetable stuff. The bacteria like it, they feed your intestine, your intestine stays healthy, and a healthy intestine means the immune system is in good shape. Now, what I'm going to talk about now is a little debated. There are haters who say this is not true, what I'm about to say, but from what I've read, the more I read, the more I believe this is true, but again, it is debated. This concept called leaky gut. What happens in leaky gut is now these tight junctions open up a little bit, and you can, there are tests you can do to test whether or not this happens. But these things open up, why? Maybe because they're not fed well. Maybe because they've ex been exposed to too much stress. We know cortisol has an impact. Maybe there's some foods that are not working well for you. Not to say that it's an allergy like people who eat peanuts and go into anaphylactic shock and need a, to give themselves an epinephrine injection. But this underlying, slow happening inflammation from foods that aren't tolerated well. And it can start to break down these junctions. And so what happens? the immune system starts to see stuff it shouldn't see. Now you've got stuff coming through and touching the immune system that normally would have been filtered by these big healthy cells. And so now we've got this inflammatory cascade that's going on and now the, the whole body can get inflamed. So what should we eat? I think we should eat a plant-based diet. That's what I think we're intended to eat is heavy, heavy plant-based diet. Now, I'm not telling you you have to be a vegan, and I'm not telling you you have to be a vegetarian. What I'm telling you is have, the, have the, the plants and don't offset the plants with other stuff. You have to have enough plants, and then healthy fats are very important as well. What concerns me in people with chronic pain, artificial sweeteners really concern me. Sugar, I think, is terrible for people with, with chronic pain. Gluten concerns me. And the overuse of animal products is very concerning. Again, I'm not telling you you have to be a vegetarian. What I'm telling you is if you rely on animal products for all of your food, you're going to have some issues. So how's the body work? Let's just think of it as a scale between anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory. So on this side, we're going to call this side omega-3. Let's just call it that. This side, we're going to call omega-6. And it's a scale, and it should be balanced. When the pro-inflammatory side is too heavy, what's it push our body towards? Inflammation. When the anti-inflammatory is too heavy, then we don't have enough inflammation. So really, we want to balance. And the, really, we think one-to-one -one is a pretty good balance. When this thing gets to be more than four-to-one, we got problems. That's what science suggests. Four-to-one is no good. You know what the average American diet is? Anyone want to guess? Six, 
12, it's 25 to 30 to one. And so we're eating garbage and we're not, we're balancing. And listen, I was guilty of it as anybody. I just didn't know any better. So I don't want you to get lost in this, but we're going to come back to this a couple times. Omega-3, we said this is, remember what this one is, omega-3? Anti-inflammatory, and this is pro-inflammatory. So what's on the anti-inflammatory side? Flax, soybean and canola oils, walnuts, hemp, modified vegetable oils, fish, fish oil, krill, seaweed. What's on this side? Pro-inflammatory. Corn. Again, we got more soybean again, so that's kind of on both sides. Sunflower and safflower oils. These are kind of, these have an interesting role that we won't get into. And on this side, we got animal products, meats, eggs, and dairy. Okay, so that's our pro versus our anti-inflammatory side. So what happens if you have too much pro-inflammatory stuff? You get inflammation, you get pro-inflammatory things in your body going on. By the way, anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, remember we talked about those earlier on? Here's what they block. They block this little enzyme here. So it takes this last step and keeps this one from happening. So it keeps us from going from this thing called arachidonic acid, the thing that's in all the animal meats, and it keeps it from turning into these pro-inflammatory mediators. Unfortunately, downstream from this enzyme is the things that keeps the blood vessels healthy, prostacyclin, and so that's why the anti-inflammatories, while they do work, that's why they cause some trouble. Okay, so pro versus anti-inflammatory. Guys got the, the idea. Now I want to introduce one other thing. Let's, let's pretend this is a, a series of events that happens, and so is this, and it comes all the way down to either pro or anti-inflammatory. There are these little shuttles in the middle that can send things one way or another. This shuttle right here, called delta-5 desaturase, that shuttle gets turned on by insulin. And so when you've got a high insulin load, all your good healthy fats get shuttled over this way. And what do they turn into? They turn into the inflammatory stuff. And so what turns insulin on? You know how you get insulin in your body? Sugar. So it's no wonder that sugar is causing pain in a lot of people. We know there's studies showing joint pain. We, we know that people need to stop eating sugar. Not only does sugar cause weight gain, which is a problem, <laughs> but it also causes, it can push toward chronic pain. Interestingly, there have been some studies that show people who are on chronic opioids, pain meds, and all of a sudden they don't work anymore. If you take the sugar out, it goes back to working the way it used to in some people. So if you say, hey, I've been on medicines for a long time, all of a sudden they don't work, look at your diet. Did you just start eating candy, eating more than you were eating before? Have you increased your sugar load? Have you developed diabetes? That's the thing. So you want to try to get sugar out. By the way, can of soda, you know how many teaspoons of sugar per can in a can of soda? Ten? It's a lot. It's a lot of sugar. So in some cases, some have suggested that a can of soda, that ten teaspoons of sugar, can push your inflammation towards the pro-inflammatory side and that infl pro-inflammatory side can be turned on and problematic for two and a half to three weeks. So when you say, I'm usually pretty good, I only have you know, one soda a day, well, may maybe that one soda a day is the difference. Gluten. Everyone know what gluten is? You hear about gluten so much. Okay, it's a mixture of the proteins found in wheat, barley, and rye, and it's what makes things fluffy. It's what makes that bread fluffy, and we've purposely made the bread fluffier the food scientists are very smart. They've done an excellent job. The bread's fluffier. It tastes better. The problem is there's more and more gluten in it. And for some people, it's fine. And for other people, it isn't. Now, people are contentious on this as well. Uh, everything I read, everything I've personally experienced tells me this is real. I believe some of this is we've changed our microbiome a little bit. We've changed the bacteria that normally live in us. And some of that's because we live in a stressful world. Some of it's we live in a dirty world. And we've got lots of pollutants. We've got, you know, chemicals and pesticides and heavy metals and all these things that we didn't used to see before. So some people might say, I don't have belly, tummy troubles. I don't have gas. I don't, so I can't have a gluten problem. You should realize that the number one presenting issues with gluten are usually not belly. Anyone know what some of the issues are, gluten? 
Skin. Skin's a great one. Right? Skin. I think anything that goes on the outside is reflected by what's going on in that gut. So skin's a good one. Mental things. ADHD, depression, brain fog. That's a good one. What else? Pain. Joint pain and muscle pain is a huge one. And it's very frequently that when I can, ha when someone comes with all this random joint pain, if we can get them off gluten, I see very frequently say, I'm better. Listen, I'm not all better, but I'm way better. Um, the other things we didn't talk about, autoimmunity, low immunity, dental issues, skin problems, uh, weight loss, weight gain. The NIH even says extra intestinal symptoms may be the prime presentation in those with gluten sensitivity. However, gluten sensitivity remains undertreated and underrecognized. So yes, people contend, but I think for people it's worth trying six weeks of no gluten. And I wouldn't recommend a gluten-free option. I wouldn't recommend gluten-free cookies and gluten-free pasta instead. There's a high glycemic index in a lot of those things, and it's, it really pushes your insulin. But I think just eating gluten and, and not even eating those refined grains at all might make a difference in some people. The artificial sweeteners, aspartame, it's broken down into methanol. Methanol is broken down into formaldehyde. This is, a, this is something that I recommend people with chronic pain stay away from artificial sweeteners completely. Sucralose, same thing. Here's a journal article that shows Splenda altering the gut microflora. So it changes what's living in our guts. It does something to that, that human uh, bacteria hybrid. Fats, this is one that comes up quite a bit. Um, we've got polyunsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats, saturated fats, and trans fat. Well, what do you make sense of? Well, let's make, it, let's make it really easy. This, trans fats are artificial fats. Those are to keep your food living uh, on the shelves for longer. That's a no-no, and we'll talk about that in just a minute briefly. Saturated fats are animal fats, and those have the problems we talked about, remember, in that balance, pro and anti-inflammatory. Polyunsaturated fats, fish oil, nuts, seeds, algae, those, those are good. Those are helpful. Monounsaturated fats, olive oil, avocado, canola, peanut, safflower, sesame, those are pretty good too. What do fats do for us? Well, I can tell you the cell, every cell in your body is covered in fat. That's what the membrane is made out of, fat. And so when you need to make a new cell, where do you think you get your fat from? Your diet, right? Like I, I can't believe I didn't think about that until someone spelled it out to me. So when you eat this stuff, this trans fat, which is plastic, by the way, it's plastic. Where does that end up? It goes into the cell you made that day. Are cells supposed to be plastic? No, they're not. And so that's a problem. And so your, your, your signaling and your chemicals get all messed up because of that, those trans fats. So here's a picture of the good stuff. This is good, this is helpful. This is anti, a lot of this stuff will be anti-inflammatory. This is some of the bad stuff. Now here's a trick with trans fats. This is where we got fooled a little bit. Everyone's agreeing trans fats are no good. And so what, what you should do, you know, you think fried or basically in trans fats, right? So the way you make a trans fat, you bubble some hydrogen through vegetable oil and you change the bonds inside the fat. Margarine is a big one, trans fat. So if you want to read the label and say, well, look at zero trans fats, it's good, I'm good. Well, look at the fine print here. It says partially hydrogenated soybean and cottonseed. That's a trans fat. Well, how can that be in there? Well, what does it mean zero? Well, zero doesn't mean zero, not, for, not, not in labeling. Zero means less than 0 0.5. And so how do you get around that? You change the serving size. And so if these are little tiny cookies that anyone in their right mind would eat 15 of, you've got zero trans fats, maybe it's 0 0.4. By the time you've had your, what you think is one serving is really three servings, you've had a real amount of trans fats. And so, Got to be careful. Just because it says zero trans fats doesn't mean there's zero trans fats. Saturated fats, these are the animal fats. We talked about that, where that comes into play here with arachidonic acid, and that becomes very inflammatory. So what am I saying? I'm saying there's a lot of fancy things we can do for pain, whether it's 
you know, interventions, whether it's therapies, medications, whether it's the fancy, you know, metabolic world, whether we're talking about functional medicine and really looking at your genetics and giving you this, maybe you don't make riboflavin right and we're giving you some extra riboflavin. But if, if you're not doing this, if you're not doing this foundational stuff, none of the rest of it works that well. This is stuff that's in your ball court. This is on your job jar. Nutrition is key. And this is something you can do today. This is one thing you can do today to start taking control of pain. So in summary, I do think there's hope for chronic pain. I think lifestyle approaches are vital. We've talked a little bit about what to eat, and it boils down to eat real food, and I'm not the first one to say that tagline, eat real food. But we've, you know, we talked about avoiding the sugar, eating the healthy fats. We talked about avoiding the, the glutens. We talked about um, the artificial sweeteners. We talked about feeding your gut, feeding that microbiome every day so your gut can be healthy, so your immune system can be healthy, so your inflammation can be turned down so you can have less pain. So that's, that's my thoughts on this. Any questions? Uh, what do we think about a healthy sweetener? Um, stevia plant can be helpful for some. Um, there's probably less wrong with that than the other sweeteners. I, I think one of the things you get people, I'm going to say it and people are going to say, nah, learning to, learning to eat with less sweeteners. And it, it takes about 21 to 28 days for the taste buds to change and for your drives to change. You may say, look, I've been putting sweetener in my coffee for the last 50 years. I'm not going to change that. Okay. So listen, maybe sugar is the best out of all of those solutions because I think the artificial sweeteners are not good. What about what? Honey. What about honey? Yeah, I think, I think, I think honey is fine. And some people have said honey's great because it, you know, may promote the immune system a little bit. It's a sweetener. It's going to push anything sweet we have is going to push us a little bit with our But I think if it's controlled and re reasonable and sustainable, listen, if you say, I can't do this unless I have a little tea in my honey, perfect. Do a little tea in your honey. How many grams of sugar can you eat is the question. I think everybody's different how much they can tolerate. It's certain when your insulin receptor starts to malfunction, right? And so that's what we're talking about is the sugar, the insulin causes insulin release. The insulin binds to the insulin receptor like a key in a lock. And when the lock doesn't work quite right, you start to get a little pre-diabetic. And then when that really breaks down, you become diabetic. be a great number, but what I could say is you, I wouldn't, add, I wouldn't be adding any sugar at all if I was pre-diabetic. I would try to eat as clean as I can. Right, so some of it, so the question is, do, are all the sugars the same? And they're handled a little differently. So if you eat, uh, if you eat a natural sugar, say like the sweetness that's in a carrot, I think it's a great point. The way the body handles it and processes it is way different, and it's more of a slow, sustained sugar load. If you have any kind of sugar, like you take a spoonful of sugar, that's going to make your, your insulin system go spike, spike right up. And so what happens is your body says, I don't want all this sugar in my bloodstream, because what does sugar do? It starts beating stuff up. You get these advanced glycosylated end products, and it breaks down your nerves. It, it's not good for your... your um, your blood cells. And so what your body do? It sends off insulin. Insulin tells the sugar to go into the cells and it drives everything into the cells. It causes things like weight gain. But then what happens? That drops. And so when the sugar drops too much, then your body says, how about some cortisol? Your body kicks on cortisol and then bumps that level back up. So people who are having a lot of sugar are having all this cortisol, and this cortisol causes belly fat, and then you know you're having up and down and up and we just want to sustain normal sugar levels. So eating real food, so a lot of vegetables. If you want to have sugars like beets, like the beet lemon, like there's a little sugar in your beet lemonade, but there's there's sugar, there's that sugar, that sweetness that are in beets, you know, in carrots. That's the kind of thing I'd be looking at. Yeah. Apples, you know, you put a whole apple, orange apple, 
So the question is, the question is, what about fruits? Yeah. For some people, listen, for some people who I think have a hard time with sugars, I, you know, maybe a, little bit of, maybe a little bit of fruit is fine. Maybe some berries is great. Tons of antioxidants. But do you want to spend your day, you know, eating only fruits? Probably not. I think I'd be heavy vegetable, and I think some fruits are, fu uh, some fruits are good. Some fruits are important. But I'd be vegetable, I'd be heavy on vegetables. What about dairy? I think when we're talking about foods that aren't tolerated, remember we talked about, hey, maybe sometimes these cells break down because we got foods that aren't tolerated. The top non-tolerated foods are gluten, soy, dairy, corn, eggs, peanuts, and coffee in some people. So many people are actually don't do well with lactose. Many, many people. Many people don't really know it. You don't know it until you stop eating it. And then you take it and you're like, Oh, that's why my guts always rumbled a little bit. And so I'm not a huge fan of dairy. I think there's other options out there. I think, you know, if you like your dairy, I think, oh, I think almond milk's a great option for many people. I'm, I'm not a huge dairy fan. Can you talk about what you know about sleep? Sure. Sleep is a talk in and of itself. Yeah. So the question is, what about sleep? Sleep is vital. Yeah, yeah so sleep the bottom line is eight hours a day. And the data shows that people with chronic pain don't sleep well. So what happens in, during sleep? There's some key things that happen at night. One, your natural opioids get repleted. Your, your body makes endorphins. And that happens normally at night. And when you've got opioids on board, you can't make as many endorphins. And so some people just don't ever feel good. But the big thing that happens in sleep, to get back to that, is that's when your growth hormone's released. So the body makes growth hormone. What's growth hormone do? It keeps our body the right shape. It gives us muscle. It makes us feel good. It keeps our lean mass there, and it keeps our fat mass from getting too big. And when you can't sleep at night, let me take a step back. The way growth hormone is released is you have to be in a deep sleep. And it has to happen a, you know, sometime midnight, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, you start releasing that growth hormone. If you're not in a deep sleep state, you won't release it. And so those people who are night owls up all, up all night, you miss that growth hormone surge. Or people who aren't sleeping well because they've got sleep apnea, you're never getting into that deep sleep, and so you're not getting that growth hormone release, and so you're missing all that. You may be training and working out, and you can't quite get it right because you don't have growth hormone. You can't quite feel well because you don't have growth hormone. So I think uh, sleep is, is really, really important. And then we know with people with fibromyalgia, well, the things that have been shown time and again to work, aqua therapy, sleep study, those are the two things that we go to very quickly. Uh, questions online. What's your opinion on probiotics? What's your opinion on supplements of, of omega-3 and marijuana? Okay, online question. What's my, uh, what's my feeling on probiotic? So I think probiotics probably make sense. Do I think they populate your gut? No, nah, the data's mixed. I'm not sure they populate your gut, but what they do seem to do is they work well as, as, a, as a gut anti-inflammatory. And so I like them for that. I take a probiotic. Do you need to take one? I, I, listen, I think if you're having troubles, I think it's part of your, your rebuilding where you're trying to limit your gut inflammation. So I'm a fan of probiotic, but the data is a little bit mixed. I don't think it causes you to grow good bacteria. I think it limits the inflammation. The way to grow good bacteria is take natural prebiotic, the stuff the bacteria eats. And then the second question was, what do I think about omega-3 supplementation? Again, mixed data. Boy, a whole bunch of mixed data. There's some poorly done studies that show some bad things. I, I, I believe they're fine, and I personally use them. But you sh if you're going to do it, read about it, the question that someone should pose is, well, listen, does it work? I don't know that it works to balance. I think it probably is helpful, and some, some studies have shown some real help with some cardiovascular issues. I think the best thing you can do is make your, make your balance, pro versus anti-inflammatory, because all we're trying to do is make a good ratio. We don't want to have more fish oil than every, everybody else, but we want to have a good ratio. But there have been some studies, especially we talk about Alzheimer's, where high um, omega-3 levels have been, prote have been uh, protective.
I don't know that there's a particular bacteria that, that I know of that causes constipation. When we talk about gas pain, we can, we can be talking about this entity called SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The bacteria kind of belong in one part of your gut, and when they make their way up to the small intestine and they overgrow, they can cause usually gas and pain about 45 minutes after you eat. And so that's called small intestine bacterial overgrowth. There's a, there's a breath test you can do, blowing into a balloon and sending it off to a lab. And there's actually a certain kind of antibiotic that you can take that the body doesn't absorb, but the, the bacteria actually eat and die. So that's called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Is there a healthy way to have a meat-heavy diet? So I tell you, a year ago I would have said yes. I'm less and less convinced that's true. Could you be, you know, we look at, we look at paleo, and I mean, that's what everyone's talking about, paleo. And paleo and Atkins and South Beach, there are a little bit of variations on a theme in that we're low in carbs and we tend to be high in other things. I think we're really good on the low in carb side. And I think if it takes a paleo diet for you to get into the vegetable scene, Great. If that's your, if that's your uh, introductory drug to, to vegetables, perfect. But I think long term, I think we are making more and more inflammation. And so I, I do think animal protein, I'm not saying you can't have any. I think it plays a really important role. But I'm telling you, heavy, 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 probably not ideal based on what I believe right now. The question is, let's talk about skin as, a, as an organ. One, how can you use it to detoxify? And two, uh, can you use it to get medications in? And I think for sure we use skin to get medications in pretty routinely. The one I think of is we, we've used some vitamin D creams in people who can't get their vitamin D levels up. I think it can work that way. We use pain creams in people. I don't have any experience in using omega any kind of omega substitute, omega threes, or or monounsaturated fats through the skin, I'm not. I, I don't know, um, but you're right. The skin is an important organ, and putting things on it, you know, the the there's some slides that show the average amount of chemicals a woman puts on her skin in the first you know hour of the morning. It's it's mind boggling. It's not all good stuff. Um, I think skin's important. I think it's a great detoxification organ, so learning how to sweat efficiently I think is really good. And it takes a while to fix the gut. I mean, there's a lot that goes in, and the, the sicker you are, the harder it is to fix the gut, but it, it's doable. It really is doable. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Thank you. Thank you.